Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There was a man from the earlier part. Mike. Is it green? It's a green. It's what you want. It's green. <laughs> Green's a beautiful color. Yes. There was a man from the early part of the first two or three centuries of after Christ by the name of Arrhenius. Arrhenius, the church leader, is where we get the word Arrhenius, which means even kill and con. I swear I'm going to try to be today because I'm wired. <laughs> and when I get wired, I get in trouble. That's why my mother used to call me Scooter when I was a little boy, and I enjoyed that Christmas at the children's store because I saw myself a lot at that particular point. Isn't it good to reflect back <clears throat> on the way things were and to appreciate <clears throat> what God has for us? What a, what a great blessing. I want to say just a few words before the message <clears throat> about uh, Stacy and I's return in four weeks. We brought some handouts for the Friday night, Sabbath morning, Sabbath vespers program that we've entitled America's Founding Principles and Their Biblical Connection. Okay? You still with me? I've come to the conviction that discernment is not natural. Discernment is taught. I find that in Scripture repeatedly. That discernment is taught. And it's a sense of continual, it comes from a sense of continual awareness of not only the times in which we're living, but our history. <clears throat> the Bible is, mine's 2,000 pages, pages mostly of history. Mostly of history, except for the parts of Revelation and Daniel. And we can cherry pick some other places as well. So I'm convinced that, and I don't mean this to sound critical, so I'm going to say it as ironically as I can. I'm convinced that many Seventh-day Adventists have become Big Bang theorists. Does anybody know what I just meant? I know you, I know you know what I said. Since the 1890s, we've been waiting for the Big Bang. In 1888, when God brought the most precious message to Minneapolis, within six weeks, A.T. Jones was sitting before the August Senate Committee and off the top of his head for hours defended religious and civil liberties. It's amazing. I'm going to tell you something. This is my conviction. That scenario is not playing out the same anymore. Oh, the end result, the Big Bang will happen. But if you're waiting for the Big Bang and not seeing the run-up elements to it, it's my position. With discernment, then we will be taken, we'll be overtaken. And the Big Bang will catch us completely off guard. Does that make any sense? Yes. yes. Back in 1774, 18 months before the Declaration of Independence, there was a young man by the name of James Madison. Heard of him? Yeah. The father of the Constitution, the fourth president. He was 22 years old. Two years out of college. 22 years old. And you, can you imagine? He wasn't on his iPhone or playing games. He was in deep thought. He knew the Bible, believe it or not. He knew history, unbelievably. 
And he wrote, at 22 years of age, wrote an ex exasperated le letter to a college friend by the name of William Bradford. Who lived in Pennsylvania. Of course, Madison was from Virginia. He wrote, and I'm going to excerpt it. This, I still can't believe this is a 22 year old kid. He says, A season of intolerance has dawned. That diabolical hell conceived principle of persecution rages. And perfectly well-meaning men of religion were finding themselves imprisoned for expressing any deviation from the views of the dominant church. He told his friend that he had, quote, squabbled and scolded, abused and ridiculed so long about this that he had no more patience for the fight. So I leave you, he said, so pity me and pray for liberty of conscience to be revived among us. That should be said today. For liberty of conscience may not be happening to your religion, but it's happening to your civil religions like crazy. And it's not political to say so. It's cowardice not to. If James were here today, he'd say, wake up, Dale. Wake up. It's very interesting. He was the last of the founders to die in 1836, but that's another story. The Big Bang is going to happen. God will have people ready for it to happen, and they will be trained by discernment of God's Word and the time. And the greatest evidence that the greatest sign that Jesus is right at the door is not the next earthquake, earthquake or the coronavirus. It's people getting excited about Jesus and his righteousness. Yes. That's the greatest sign. Yes. I had a text last night from a buddy. I can't mention his name yet, but I will. Most of you would know him. And his text hardly allowed me to sleep. Because he is on fire. And it's a good hot fire. The message today is two dead ducks. Two dead ducks. You know where the word, the term dead duck comes from? James Madison was alive when that term, coined, that term was coined. It's believed to be coined around 1829 when an outgoing senator, one that was his term had expired, was labeled a dead duck. But, of course, that's too strong of a term, so we have more of it has morphed into lame duck. A lame duck. The little boy was visiting his parents, his grandparents actually, he was given a slingshot. <clears throat> Little boy that cut his hand, probably. <laughs> he, did, he went out to the woods to practice, and he wasn't very good. He never could hit the target. But as he came back in from the woods, he spied Grandma's prize duck. And he took a shot. And unfortunately, he was good at that shot. And there the duck lay dead. Terrified, he grabs the dead duck and puts it in the wood pile, only to look up and see his sister has been watching him all the time. After lunch that day, Grandma says, Sally, I need some help with the dishes, so would you take some time and help me out, please? Sally leans over to Johnny and says, Johnny, remember the duck? Uh, Grandma, Johnny's going to help. He said he'd be happy to. <laughs> this happened day after day while they were at Grandma and Grandpa's house. 
Later one day, Grandpa asked the children if they wanted to go fishing. Grandma says, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help make supper. Again, she whispered, remember the day. So after several days of Johnny doing Sally's chores, he goes to grandmother and confessed that he had killed the duck and how sorry he was. I know, Johnny, she said, giving him a hug. I was standing at the window and saw you the whole time. I was just wondering how long it was going to take you to stop allowing Sally to make a slave out of you <laughs> before you confess. Doesn't that kind of capture us? The author and the sustainer of sin, the slavery to sin, Satan, is always whispering over our shoulder. Remember, you're a sinner. Remember, you're not good enough. And it's true. So many times our words, thoughts, and actions demonstrate that we still have, and I love the way was it Ray, I guess it was, talked about real estate in our hearts. Where a certain real estate in our hearts still is an occupying plantation for slavery. We all know that Satan's slavery leads to unhappiness, unrest, rebellion, ending in eternal annihilation, says Romans 6.23. I'm going to add parenthetically here. I don't remember if it's in my notes later, but I don't want to forget it. You know, the greatest lie, or one of the greatest lies that Satan has ever told is that happiness is found in his realm. And do you know that a lot of people even appeal to the Declaration of Independence as justification because it doesn't, didn't promise right? The pursuit of what? The unalienable rights of life, liberty, meaning that they came not from us, not from the government, but from God. That's what Thomas wrote. And that last one, though, trips people up, the pursuit of happiness. And I wonder, why did he write that? That sounds so trite, pursuit of happiness. And then one day I came across a, a letter from George Washington, you know, the first guy. He clarified what that means. To Washington and a number of the other founders, the pursuit of happiness meant the pursuit of virtue. Makes sense, doesn't it? There is no happiness apart from virtue. Amen. And you see why people want to flip that on its head because happiness is often defined by sinning, whereas the founders defined it by virtuous living. These guys were great guys. Flawed to the core like me. A dead duck apart from Christ like me. God wants to take our slavery to sin and gives us total freedom to serve Him in peace, contentment, and true happiness in obedience to His law. I mentioned in Sabbath school, I was astounded to find out this week that there is a book written by a law professor called Three Felonies a Day that a, the that a government's trying to correct people's errant lives by more laws, more laws, more laws. This law professor said that the average writes that the average American commits three unknown felonies a day. That's how many laws there was. Did you know there was 80,000 pages added to the federal registry between 2015 and 2016? One year, 80,000 pages. Man trying to correct man. It's God's job. Today's study gives us, I believe, a clear overview 
of just where the line is drawn between salvation and damnation. It's not complicated. It's simple. But it's hard. Because the hardest battle we'll ever fight is a battle against who? Self. Today's study gives us this clear overview, I believe. It's simple. It's not about outward behavior. It's about complete and total renunciation of anything good in me so that God can reveal Himself through my outward behavior. And Christ chooses in this great parable to illustrate the contrast between salvation and damnation through the respective attitudes of prayer. Go to Luke 18 again. Luke 18, verse 9. I want to connect it with verse 8 as a beginning, shall I? Because this may be my favorite text in the, in the New Testament, verse 8 of chapter 18. Because Jesus makes this remarkable statement. When the Son of Man comes, will He really find what? He didn't say, will He find your name on the Seventh-day Adventist membership list. He didn't say, will you be paying tithe? He didn't say, will you be, have your calendar straight? He didn't say any of that. He could have, but he didn't. What does he say? Will he really find faith on the earth? That's why we are, I think, and I'm just digressing here, back and I'm regressing just a little bit. And I think that's one of the things that's keeping us kind of locked up in a way with our big bang theory waiting for the big one while when we should be loving people in the interim and understanding what's making the life around them tick. So what does that faith look like? I believe it's to a great extent explained in the parable. He spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Be very, 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 very careful. I admonish you, I urge you to say, we've got the truth. Oh, Dale, you just went too far. The great apostle Paul says, I have not yet arrived. Who am I, who are you to say that you have? Oh, yes, we have beautiful truths, but they're not all done yet, are they? Then the scripture also say the great apostle Paul that the light would shine more brightly until that perfect day. I got a quote. I didn't intend to use it. Here it is. Written by a little lady who wrote a lot of books. Where are you? I know you're here. Yes. Even some of the Adventists are in danger of closing their eyes to the truth as it is in Jesus. In other words, there's more to see. Because it contradicts something which they have taken for granted as truth. Let all be very modest and seek most earnestly to put self out of the question and to exalt Jesus. I inadvertently offended a woman a couple of days ago down in Naples by something I said that I was assuming she wasn't one of them, but she was. It's how we respond when we offend somebody that makes a big difference too, doesn't it? You can't walk our words back, but you can sure Choose them carefully in the future. Two men went up to the temple to pray. I call them two dead ducks. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Notice verse 11. Notice verse 12. You'll see exactly as many eyes as you do in Isaiah 14, which describes Lucifer's determination to displace, replace God. I will be like the Most High. 
I will do this. I'll, I've got the truth. No, Jesus has the truth. Amen. He says, pray thus, not to God, but with Himself. I thank you that I am not God. I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, politicians, I don't have to say that, unjust. Could have said preachers in there. We got our issues too. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers are even this reprehensible tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. How much do we possess? Nothing. David said, out of, the, out of thy own I have given thee. Out of thy own I have given thee. Yes. Yes, this Pharisee, this is a Mr. Holy Joe. He knew the Bible, the Old Testament. That's all they had. Inside out, he was a leader in the church. He was a pure Jew. He was circumcised. He knew the law. He had the clean and unclean laws down pat. Check. State of the dead. Check. Right day of the week. Check. All 28 of the fundamentals. Check. Undoubtedly, this guy could probably trace his genealogy all the way back to Abraham, the first Jew. Secondly, we have the Republican. I started to say the Republican. <laughs> Could have. The word in antiquity simply means one who manages an IRS district. He was a tax collector. He wasn't paid a salary as I understand the history. He was an independent contractor. Apparently, it works something like this. The Roman government would say to Zacchaeus, you know, we read about him later, or earlier, the tax collector actually in Luke 19, we need a million bucks out of your district, and anything you can collect over and above that, you get to pop. So you can imagine old Zacchaeus thinking, well, oh, they only need a million. I think I can get 1.2, 1.3. That's mine. It's not a bad salary. Not only are they, they extortioners, they were considered by their fellow Jews as traitors who had sold out to the Roman government. They were shasters. They're basically not much better than the mafia gangsters. So here we find the respected and the despised. Here we have the respected, the Pharisee, and the despised with only one thing significant in common. What do you think it is? They're both dead ducks. Both deserve hell because both are dead sinners. Does not Roman chapter 3 tell us that clearly that all have found what? Sin. Sin and come short of the glory of God? And Galatians 3.10 tells us that unless you keep the law perfectly, you're doomed. Thank God we have a Savior. Amen. Oh, the Pharisee praying to himself, oh, how many times does that apply to me? God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I've got the truth. Rather than, God, I thank you, you revealed yourself to me in this way. Here's the kicker, though, about this Pharisee that really kind of stunned me a little bit as I studied this out. We normally think of Pharisees as the epitome of hypocrisy. Would that be accurate? And that's generally true. However, as I learned from John Wesley and confirm with my own, take a look at this carefully, what he's doing here is not necessarily hypocrisy. Hypocrisy literally means in the Greek, stage play. 
stage play, drum, that's why I'm not keen on it. Stage play is the actual word. In fact, they would, you know, often, they would, uh, you maybe have, have seen this, when they would do their stage plays, they'd have different masks for the different characters that they would move back and forth and in and out of with their little masks. I don't really believe this guy's a hypocrite. I believe he's locked in to his own reality. He really believes what he is saying. Prophets of the Kings, page 55. Speaking of the wisest man who ever lived. Who was that? Wow. The smartest dude to ever walk the face of the earth. Went from the magnificent display of just God-given wisdom of properly deciding who the mother of this particular child before him was to within a couple of decades, I don't know exactly how long, sending children to be burned up, to be aborted, if you please. She wrote, So gradual was Solomon's apostasy that before he was aware of it, He had wandered far from God, and then I added, from saving children to sacrificing them. So is it in America, and so has it been condoned even among us. Or at least it's condoned because we don't speak out like we should. Yes, he clearly believes that he's reached the standard by which all others should be measured. Oh, brothers and sisters, who do we think we're better than them today? Do we hear someone give less than an intelligent answer in Sabbath school and think poor uninformed sap? Or do we look around and see someone that we don't know, that, that we know, and we know that we haven't done what they've done? And feel just a little tinge of, Lord, I'm thankful I'm not like. A number of years ago, I'm trying to remember exactly how long this has got to be, at least eight or nine years ago, I was in California as to preach at a little church in South Lake Tahoe. Beautiful spot. And a woman had called me up and asked me to come and speak. She said she was a sub school superintendent. I didn't know her from my wife seven years ago. We've been married. We're in our seventh year. And I got up there and I met this lady. And she says, I won't be staying for church. I said, oh. And then I found out later why. It was not a safe place for her to be. That church. It was okay for Sabbath school, but for worship, certain people apparently came to church that were totally condemning of her. Do you know why? Her husband had been, her, her husband was a nurse practitioner and he had been accused and was in jail waiting trial for molesting one of his patients. At home were three adopted boys and no dad. And I thought to myself, how tragic that this woman is not safe in her own church. The spirit of Phariseeism lives, even in California. I visited that man later in prison, a couple of weeks or so later. I was convinced he was innocent. This was long before the Me Too movement, but I didn't know. But I knew that he had a heart for God. Has any of us sitting here or standing here today ever done anything that should 
disqualifies for heaven? Well, I have. If you have it, God bless you. <clears throat> Maybe the greatest lesson to learn is that condemnation is the work of the devil, not God. It is his goodness that leads to repentance and hence to change life. Having said that, however, having said that, I must say this. God has not given us the responsibility to condemn any person, but He has given us the responsibility.